occupied ancestral land of the Muscogee Nation and housed in a building constructed by free, recently enslaved African Americans. My name is Ralph Banks and I'm, to, I'm your service associate today. We welcome all of you to our service, especially those of you who are searching for a spiritual home. Many of us were once too seeking for something larger than ourselves which we could belong a sense of rootedness to hold us as we create meaning together. We do that well here, though not perfectly. In this congregation, we strive not for perfection, but for authenticity and connection. Whether it's your first time in worship with us or your hundredth time, we hope that you'll find here questions that stretch you, some people to befriend you, and liberal religious values that challenge you to join us in loving boldly, living justly, and welcoming radically. I call your attention to the announcements that are printed on the bottom of the order of service. Please read these for important information about Fellowship Lab. The spoken announcement will be heard at the end of the hour. On behalf of the members of the Fellowship, I extend a special welcome to all visitors who are joining us for the first time. And to those of you who still feel like visitors, if you've not already done so, please fill out our visitor book at the front of the readers or digitally by visiting auf.org slash visitor. You may also contact our minister, Reverend Chris Rothbauer, at minister at auf.org with any questions or concerns you may have. As we prepare, prepare for our service this morning, please remember to turn off your phone and other electronic, electronic devices to silent. Let us move into the service, willing to be authentic with each other, honest within ourselves, and open to communication in all its forms. Our opening words this morning are from Sunshine Jeremiah Wolf. This is a congregation that gathers in faith, not faith in one religion or one God, 
or any one way. We gather in faith of the power of diversity, the power of love, and the hope of a world transformed by our care. We gather in faith of ourselves and those around us, not a faith that requires perfection or rightness in one another, rather a faith that in our shared imperfection, we may learn to stumble and fall together. <clears throat> faith that we will help one another to rise and to try again and again. We are Unitarian Universalists. Wow, the choir gets organized. Our next version. Um, I want to explain that Lorna contacted me as a music chair, and we were on the same wavelength, so I'm worried about Lorna for the moment. Um, there will be a part in here. You recognize the song, Summer Music, just go on for a while. Well, we got some verses that were written by a number of people, and based on how many choir members showed up for rehearsal, well, that's how many verses we got. So, at the very, very end, Victoria will cue you because your final words are goodbye. Got it? <laughs> I knew you could. <laughs> We want our chalice this morning with these words from Nick Wilbur. We light our chalice this morning in the spirit of gratitude, thankful for years of ministerial service to this church, for celebrations of life and death, dedications and communions, for leading worship, grounding our congregation in spiritual practice, helping us to navigate the wonders and stresses of this world and make sense of good times and bad. 
Thank you for being a leader, a comforter, and a friend. Thank you for being our minister. As is our tradition, we also light a candle in solidarity with those families and individuals separated and sub suffering at our southern border. We light our peace candle this week for the Nigerian bandit conflict, an ongoing conflict between the country's government and various gangs and ethnic militias. Starting in 2011, the insecurity remaining from the conflict between the Fulani and Hausa ethnic groups quickly allowed other criminal and jihadist elements to form in the region. At least 12,000 people have been killed in fighting in Nigeria since 2011. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join us in singing our opening hymn, hymn number 346 in the great hymnal. Come sing a song with me. by sharing our joys, concerns, and milestones. If you are joining us virtually, we invite you to type your joy and concern for milestone in the YouTube chat box during the music and meditation. We invite you in person to one of the times drop a pedal into our communal bubble during the music for meditation. Spoken joys and concerns will be invited following the music. <laughs> Thank you. 
Businesses, please don't line up. Come forward after the last person has left the microphone. I know some of us used email better than others, so I don't want to assume everyone saw the announcement on Sunday afternoon, but I have been asked to candidate with Horizon Union Church in Carleton, Texas, on starting on Friday. So I'll be going Friday to the North Dallas suburbs to um, candidate, and I appreciate everyone who's asked and wanted to make sure I didn't assume that there were people that everyone had in heard. Joyce in seeing all of you here. Um, and Camilla with her blue hair and smiling face. Um, Chris, Calvin, um, thank you. And I am, I am a, a mix because it is Memorial Day weekend and it's the weekend when so many people have died. 12,000 in Nigeria since when um, so many have died from gun violence, we're going to have a presentation. Um, thank God for that Carol group that we're going to have that this morning on the 28th. I wanted to just share a joy. I'm wearing this jacket today that was given to me by my friend on death row who I got to know in the 80s. And I got to know not only him, but many other people. All of them, just like all of us are more than the worst thing we've ever done. And I've done plenty of worse things. And I'm so thankful that AUUF is signing on for whom the bells toll so that we will mark the memory of those who have been killed and we will mark the memory of those who otherwise, for all the victims. And I just want to say thank you for lifting them up as we toll our bell when it's very likely that Governor Ivy will soon begin a, a lethal injection. And thank you, Jim, you can follow the work on this. And thank you, Brian Baldwin, my really good friend, and all of the others. So thank you for this moment. Peace to you. Nothing so momentous, but I just wanted to share a joy for our family with you. My brother Sean, his wife, and their twin girls are coming back uh, back through Auburn um, after two years living and working abroad, and they're going to mom's going to get to have a, have a couple of really good visiting days with them, and we're all excited to see them. I got to thank everybody kind of one on one last week during the service, and I just wanted to you know express my gratitude for, you know, for better, for, uh, you know, being able to be with all of you. And again, I want to express my true gratitude for you as a beautiful mentor and supervisor. And with that, I have a lot of show of my own today. I will be uh, the celebrant at All Souls uh, Church at the Bush Center at 4 o'clock. 
twelve thousand convincing the sermon for Pentecost. So uh, a little bit scary, but a little bit exciting. <laughs> My good, good friend Carol Luther is here for the first time, and I hope she likes it. And I was so happy that the choir did what it did, because I think that's going to encourage Carol to come back. <laughs> choir, that was just incredible. Thank you, Martha, wherever she is. Oh, my God. I mean, that was, she is so um, creative and uh, just everything good. May all the joys, concerns, and milestones of this community, those shared on how and those held in silence, we receive into the care and concern of all present. Our moment for all ages today is led by our religious coordinator, by our coordinator of religious exploration, Angela Farmer. A lot of friends today come on up with me. So I did a thing this week. I cleaned out my closet. <laughs> How many of you clean out your closets from time to time, and like once a year, or whatever you guys think to clean out your closets? I was thinking about Rev Chris while I was cleaning out my closet because I know that they are packing up, and that is, you know, that is a thing where you've got to kind of sort through your stuff, right? So in thinking about that, I started thinking. You know, I think in metaphors anyway. So I started thinking. When you clean out your closet, how do you decide what to keep and what to get rid of? What do you do? What do you decide? How do you decide? What still fits. What still fits. How about you? <laughs> same, same, what still fits. How about anybody else? How do you decide? What do you like? And things that are too small for you, like clothing that is too tight. If you outgrew it, you don't need that in your closet, right? Okay, so I'm going to show you some of the things that I have, right? <laughs> oh, man. So I love this sweater. It has been with me through many a horse show in the winter. You know, it is, it, it, feel how thick that is. Yeah. You know what it didn't do very well? Go in the dryer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my partner did the laundry one day and thanks. <laughs> right? I was very grateful for the assistance. Right? <laughs> These were my favorite shoes when I had all of the discs in my bag. <laughs> They're still beautiful. I still love them. I will not ever wear them, but I'm not really going to get rid of them. Well, I like these shoes. I like your shoes too. They light up when you when you and they fit they fit you very nicely. Yeah, they light up. Have a look at this gem. Yeah. It still has the tags on it. Hey, Feel that one. Hey, yeah, this is something that I only pull out for would only pull out for like one occasion. And that was like if I was going to like an ugly sweater party or something, I would probably wear that. I did not obtain this for myself. It was a gift. And for that I am also very, very grateful. I will talk to you about shoes when we go outside. How's that sound? Alright. Everybody's got one of these. Oh well. Not everybody, I suppose, but you know, the um, the bridesmaid dress that the bride swears you're gonna wear again. It didn't fit me good then. It only looked good on half of us anyway. 
to be nervous. You know, it's always the, it's gonna look good on everybody, and you know, you can wear it again. Nope. So that, and then right at the last minute, I saw this, and it was like folded inside out and kind of tucked under all of my other hoodies. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. So when I got a look, I realized why this has not been in my hoodie circulation. Let me pull the cart for you so you can see. I realized that I did like this hoodie when I first got it and then I learned some things. When I learned some things, I learned that this hoodie might hurt people that I love. Yeah, wearing this hoodie, even though it seems kind of benign, there are people that I love very dearly. This, and for those of you who don't know, this is from Harry Potter. And so there are people for whom wearing something of J.K. Rowling's would be harmful to my friends. And I don't want to hurt my friends. So that's why that one ended up in the back of the closet. And it's going to go back in the back of the closet until I just figure out how to get the sticky stuff. Put the orange thing on my shoe. I will put the orange thing on your set sketchers, right? You want one? Go ahead. So, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit, but you're going to see where I'm going with it. Does anybody remember how long ago this church started? Everett wants his letter. The, 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 and probably finished. The, 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 yeah, like, yeah, I know, right? It's two different things. Is it the, is the church, is the building the church, or are the people the church, right? So it's been about 62 years since 22 charter members formed the Auburn Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, and about 42 years since we started meeting in this building, which predates our existence. So think about what those people had in their closets. Were their clothes similar to ours or different? 42 years, 62 years. So like the 80s, we were dressing different. In the 60s, we were dressing different. Those people came here on Sundays. They heard sermons. They prayed, prayed prayers and read readings. They sang hymns and taught children about what was important. And they did all that just like us. But how they did it was as different as the clothes we wear. Now, I'm not suggesting that we maintain our faith as though it were a fashion statement, subject to the whims of popular culture. But I do suggest that our garments often reflect our values. And there's a metaphor to be had especially if we are a non-dogmatic people. What does that word mean? Hmm. So to be dogmatic is to follow a set of rules no matter what. So there's the metaphor. The things we believe, our religious ideas, are kind of like the clothes in our closet. For the clothes, we need to look at our beliefs and the way that we relate with each other and the things that we do. Every once in a while, and ask, ask ourselves, do they still fit? Are they comfortable? Do they hurt people we love? Did they end up in the dryer accidentally? <laughs> Is it something we borrowed or inherited and really never intend to use except for maybe on that weird Christmas? Uh, maybe it's something we're only keeping for sentimentality's sake. I've got a lot of those things to bring any of those, but I've got some. Maybe we figured that we figured something out that makes us not want to wear it anymore. Perhaps we've grown. So we want our beliefs to reflect who we really are on the inside. So we keep the things that fit, still work, and still have meaning for us when we wear them. Like our clothes, we want our beliefs to change a little as we grow and change so that we always remain true to who we are. And that, I think, is quite possibly the best lesson that I have learned from them, Chris, that this is a growing... I, I grew up in a dogmatic religion, and growing and learning and changing scares me. But y'all have made it a welcome and safe place to happen. So, I love you all. We're going to go outside now. <laughs>
please show me in the spirit of contemplation in whatever way feels right with these words from Gordon B. McKinnon. Ministry is all that we do together. Ministry is that quality of being in community that affirms human dignity, beckons forth hidden possibilities, invites us into deeper, more constant, reverent relationships, and carries forward our heritage of hope and liberation. Ministry is what we do together as we celebrate triumphs of our human spirit. Miracles of birth and life, wonders of devotion and sacrifice. Ministry is what we do together with one another in terror and torment, in grief and misery, and pain enabling the presence of death to say yes to life. We who minister speak and live the best we know with full knowledge that it is never quite enough, and yet are reassured by lostness found, fragments reunited, wounds healed, and joy shared. Ministry is what we all do together. A religious community is like a river formed from the many streams of our lives that meet and merge and flow to the sea. As members and friends of this religious community, we share our time and energy, our creativity, imagination, and vision, our talents, skills, and gifts, and the streams of our individual lives create a river that is both deep and broad, a river that is made of many streams, sustains life, and refreshes the land through which it flows. But the river of this community also depends on our shared financial support that makes real our shared values and with vision. We will now receive an offering for the support of this religious community and its work in the world. You're invited to give generously and joyfully as you are willing and able. If this is your first time with us, Please allow an offering basket to pass you by. Your presence with us is gift enough. To make a donation online via PayPal, please visit auf.org slash donate. Please indicate in the notes whether your donation is for your pledge or the offering. If you're writing a check, please make your check available and payable through auf. And they don't put a note on the memo line about whether it is for the offering or your pledge and drop it in the offering bowl or mail it to P.O. Box 669, Auburn, Alabama 36831. The offering will now be gratefully received. <coughs> Thank you. 
Departure sermons are a funny thing. You ask 10 different ministers what the best way to do one is, and you'll get 11 different answers. But what most of them have in common is that they it's a feeling of saying something that needs to be said before the minister leaves. After all, ministry and preaching in general is a delicate balance. There, um, although we enshrine freedom of the pulpit in our way of being religious, let's face it, we don't just get up here and spew whatever comes to our minds every week. That would be pretty disastrous. But there's a feeling that towards the end of the ministry, why not say a few things? Because what are you going to do, fire me? <laughs> and though some of these sermons are, tend to metaphorically set the house on fire, I fortunately don't have to do that this morning. What I will say is that early in my ministry here at AUUF, I said that the only constant in life is change. Despite how often you may hear the virtues of being present in the moment expounded in spiritual circles, it's a surety that eventually you will need to think about what's coming towards the future. As John F. Kennedy once said, change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. No matter how much we try to put off change, everything is in constant flux. The way things are now won't be the way they will be a year or even a minute from now. Even your body, as constant as it may look, is changing even as we're sitting here this morning because biology tells us that your cells are constantly dying and being reborn. So in many ways, there is nothing about you that is truly constant your entire life. And that is a problem that has confounded philosophers and theologians for centuries. But I want to say, that's not necessarily a bad thing. After all, imagine if we never grew and changed. What if we all still had the fears and misconceptions and lack of ability to make our way independently in the world? I once saw a sci-fi movie that asked just that. What if we never changed and we never died. The protagonist was practically begging to be able to commit suicide because after a thousand years, things had grown quite dull. And we'd always be struggling with the same issues over and over again in a perpetual groundhog day of recurrence that if it were me, I'd be quite unhappy. For now, for how natural change is, though, we humans sure do rebel against it. In ancient times, this might have had survival value because a predictable world is one that makes it easier to keep a predator from making us their dinner. In a time when survival means predicting the future, it makes sense to reject change. But in modern society, where flourishing often means being willing to change to rapidly changing conditions, an unwillingness to change can leave us struggling to find our way into the future. It's the reason so much of Modern society is predicated on helping people adjust to the story of their lives, to find ways to embrace change, 
recognizing that so many of the emotional conditions of the modern age are rooted in a resistance that finds us, whether we want it to or not. In today's age, resistance to change can lead to a lot of pain as we struggle against forces we can't prevent. What I've proposed over and over again in my four years here is that we, what we need is less resistance to change and more willingness to adapt to the needs of the time. What worked in 1961 or, or 1981 or 1991 or 2001 or even 2011 is unlikely to work now simply because the conditions that allow success have also changed. If we're not constantly reevaluating things and just expect our old solutions to work to new problems, we will cause ourselves more pain than we must in our quest. Adaptation would call on us to ask, what does this moment demand? rather than what worked in the past. What do we need right now versus what is comfortable? This is especially relevant to Unitarian Universalism, as well as to the larger religious landscape. A few weeks ago, I was asked to participate in a multi-generational panel sponsored by the Unitarian Universalist Retired Ministers and Partners Association. One of my fellow participants, the Reverend Arvid Straub, recently wrote a paper based on his own observations and research in which he came to the unfortunate conclusion that he believes three quarters of our congregations will be non-existent in 15 years. He thinks this is down to a combination of aging congregations, lack of young adults who coming in, and a general lack of willingness to change to the demands of religious life in the 21st century. Now, before anyone says anything, I suspect this is a prediction that Arvid would like to be wrong about. But the reality is that many of our congregations are still functioning in the same way as the 1970s, if not older. Many of them are repeating the same patterns over and over again and demanding different results. It is really easy to understand their behavior by simply reading their history as there is almost always a precipitating event or a history of behavior that the congregation just can't move beyond. And their lack of willingness to find new ways of being is to their own detriment. Now, I'm about to say something that's probably going to make some in the room feel a bit uncomfortable. But I couldn't have told you what this congregation was like firsthand in the 1970s, if for no other reason than I kind of missed out on the entire decade. I was born in 1980. And yet people even younger than I am can come into a congregation and become part of the same cycle eventually. Because systems theory tells us that systems will fight against change. Over and over again in congregational conflict, many church consultants will say that churches will get rid of someone they label as a troublemaker and then be completely surprised that someone rises up to take their place. Because that's how systems 
work until someone is willing to break them. And it's hard to break them because the reality is even within a year of coming into a system, you're now a part of it. When I was thinking about what I wanted to say to you with my final sermon, these are the things I was thinking about. The next decade will be critical for you, not only for our congregation and you, but also for the larger Unitarian Universalist movement. I am sorely aware that with my departure, there will only be two full-time UU ministers left in the state of Alabama. Two congregations in the last year have sold their buildings. One of them dropped from full to half-time ministry. One of them dropped ministers altogether. And one of them is even looking at merging with a larger congregation just to survive. In a world where many people are abandoning traditional religious institutions because they see them as irrelevant in their lives. As much as we you use would like to pretend we aren't a traditional religious institution, we are indeed. And our history dates back as least as far as most of our Protestant cousins. All of this has been precipitated by the pandemic, but it started before. Someone said something in the congregational meeting last week that is so true. We have not gone back to how things were before the lockdown, and the reality is we probably never will. Some people decided to return, and others are seeking us, looking for some hope in these uncertain times. This is my final charge to you. Hearing that statistic, hearing that it is distinctly popular, possible, not popular, that only a quarter of our congregations may survive in 15 years. What are you going to do to make sure you're one? It's a question I can't answer for you. But I'd love for you to prove Arvid Straub wrong. He's a great guy, but Let's prove him wrong. What will we do? And this is the other part. If you are to survive, it will be because you have been able to let go of the way things are and forge ahead to the way they could be. Any time you're tempted to reference the way things were or what's worked in the past, it will be up to you to stop yourselves and ask whether that's still what's needed in the present. If I have some minister call me in a couple of years and say they keep saying this is how it was during Reverend Chris's time, I'm not going to call up whoever's board president and say, you better stop, but you better be sure I'm going to be cursing you under my breath. <laughs> because you do not need what I have been. You need what is coming next. I can't tell you what that will take. I'm not sure I was ever able to. I can tell you that the people who are coming to Unitarian Universalism are looking for a community where they can grow, find fellowship, and make a difference in the world. <coughs> and this is my charge to you. Find how to make a difference in the world. 
you're not going to find it huddled around the board tape around the table in the Bush Center during the board meeting. You're not going to find it by debating the minutia of whether we're going to switch from wow to spectrum for cable or whether we're going to have blue or black curtains or whether we're going to have full, even full or part-time ministry. You will find it when you listen to that new mission and vision statement that you passed last week and asked, what is it demanding of you now? And if you wait for a sure answer, you will fail. But if you dare to go out and find some ways to make this world a better place, you will succeed. So continue welcoming everyone. Theist and atheist, Christian, Buddhist, pagan, humanist, welcome them all because that is the core of Unitarian Universalism. In a time when people are under attack from our state legislatures, they need you. In my first sermon as minister at AUUF, I left you with this charge. Now that we are together, let us not forget the lessons the journey has taught us up till now. Let us go forth from here, finding our missing puzzle pieces and bring them to this fellowship, for our community is not complete. And there is always room at our table for one more. And that hasn't changed in the last four years. And it may be even more critical than it was four years ago. So listen to each other. Certainly there is wisdom in the older generation. But what Unitarian Universalism was seeking even a decade ago has changed. If you want to appeal to the next generation of potential you use, listen to them. Center their voices when you ask them to be in leadership. Let them lead. Listen to the wisdom they have gained from living in the world as it is now. I know that my departure is a shock for many of you. In fact, I suspect that a lot of you would say that you wish I was staying. I'm not going to go into the why today, but I will say that if you are willing to imagine what the future could hold, you will survive and thrive. And this is another charge. Don't let me be the last minister of this congregation. So continue into the future. Find your place in the Auburn Opelika area and the wider UU world and find out how you will be relevant to the needs of the millennials and the Gen Z's and the Gen Alphas who are the future of this congregation if there is to be a future. And don't forget that you are lovable and loved. When I accepted your call in 2019, I never could have imagined what this ministry would be like. I did not come here knowing that eight months in, we would be in a global lockdown. But we survived and in many ways thrived. So may you find your future as possibility that will enable you to create beloved community long into the future. And I will always be proud to have served as your minister and of what we were able to accomplish together. May it be so.
going to have Peter come up here in a minute and help lead us in a ritual, a short ritual of leave taking. Uh, there is a role for all of you, and it is printed in the uh, reading that is in your order of service. Whenever you see a part that says people, that's your role. You're all set to go. Our fellowship family is constantly changing. People come and go. Babies are born. Children grow up. People commit themselves to one another. Loved ones and friends among us come to the end of their lives. Individuals move into our community and church life. Others leave us, moving away to new places, new experiences, and new opportunities. It is important and right that we recognize these times of passage, of endings, and beginnings. On May 19, 2019, this congregation called Reverend Chris Rothbauer to serve as our minister. I thank the Auburn Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, its members and friends for the love, kindness, and support shown me these last four years. I ask forgiveness for the mistakes I have made, but I am grateful for the ways my leadership has been accepted. As I leave, I carry with me all that I have learned here. We receive your thankfulness and offer forgiveness and accept that you now need to minister elsewhere. We express our gratitude for your time among us. We ask your forgiveness for our mistakes. I forgive you and accept your gratitude, trusting that our time together and our parting are all part of life's evolution. To you, the members and friends of the Auburn Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, release Reverend Chris Rothbauer from the duties of position. Thank you. Do you offer your encouragement for their ministry serving Horizon Unitarian Universalist Church. Do you, Rev. Chris, release this church from turning to you and depending on you? I do. Do you offer your encouragement for the continued ministry here and on the relationship with another who will come to serve? I do. We give thanks for the moments we have shared with Rev. Chris in worship, in learning, in service. We pray that their journey will be safe and meaningful as they move to a new and unknown place. So, so Please join me one more time and rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn. Number 311 in the great hymnal, let it be a dance. Oh,
thing to your careless. You will find the words in your order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, or the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. Please we carry in our hearts until we are done in our opinion. Please be our guest today after the service for coffee hour here in the sanctuary. This is an opportunity to chat with people about the service, or just have a week with us. All are welcome to join, whether you're brought a fish or not. If you're not, if you're not signed up for our email list, please make sure to do so to receive updates about ways to connect. You can find information on signing up at our web, at our website, auuf.org slash subscribe. I invite anyone with a spoken announcement to come forward at this time. One at a time for the microphone. I want to call your attention to yoga class that says it's on May 30th is incorrect. All our instructors are traveling, so we will meet again on June 6th. Also on June 4th, which is Sunday at 2 o'clock here in the sanctuary, there'll be some drumming going on if you want to come and drum. And then that'll end about 3.30, and then I'm headed out to Kiesel Park for the uh, Pride event and... Um, you can ride with me if you want. I'll be staying until we shut down. <laughs> the next game night is June 9th over in the Bush Center. Bring games, you can bring food, you can just bring your lovely selves, so come and play. Hi, I'm Carol Carew, and I want to invite all of you to stay for a presentation. It is going to be a, um, from 12 to 1 here, and it is um, being presented by um, Dr. Paula Wilson, who is the co-lead for Moms Demand Action for, Against Gun Violence in, Al in the state of Alabama. And um, this uh, presentation will be about an hour long, and it will be a background information about the permit risk security law, which became on Alabama on uh, Jan January 23, and the serious implications for the state. And it's going to cover things like who can now carry a concealed firearm in public, data about gun violence in Alabama, and why permitless, permitless carry will make it worse, where one can conceal carry and where they cannot, why law enforcement fought the passage of this law and the serious problems they have identified with it now that it has been implemented, how the law defunds law enforcement, and what you can do to help change the law. And we will be also um, having uh, some folks come from outside of the congregation. And, um, so I think this is very important information. Please uh, stay to um, on this presenter and to to uh, find out more about this important law and its implications for us. Thank you. It's so silent in here. Do you know why? Because we have lovely playground volunteers. Children <laughs> outside. The RE program needs more playground volunteers. I'm going to be stepping up and volunteering more regularly. I uh, hope all of you will too. Uh, having that space to not have the children in here is a nice respite for parents like Lacey and me um, and others in here. So I hope all of you will consider stepping up and volunteering to help on the playground, especially since a purpose of Reverend Chris's sermon, that does seem to be one area where we are growing. Did you see how many were down here? Yeah. Glorious, I love it. Hi, I'm Carter. I actually have a couple of Pride-related announcements. Of course, Pride Fest is next Sunday. I'll try and remind you again next Sunday. Um, but today, Pride on the Plains is having a fundraiser. It is a pancake breakfast out at Town Creek. So go grab pancakes and sausage or bacon, and then you can come back for the Moms Demand Action presentation on Permit Miss Carrie. Um, and then also, I know Aisha has been operating via email. I know maybe not everybody's on the email, but we are trying to group together to walk in the Pride Parade next Friday. I think they parade at 6. Um, so if you haven't got that email and want to walk with us, um, 
I'm going to try and walk. I think Lori and Gary LaRue, Jan Newton, you can find one of us to get in on the information. Um, also, after the parade in downtown Opelika, I co-host a live game show. We've been doing it for about a year. It's like The Price is Right, but it's movie trivia instead of groceries, and we will be doing an LGBTQ film-themed version. Um, it's in the jailhouse, which is behind Rock and Roll Pinball. So come to the parade, stay, and come play some movie trivia and win some local gift cards. Thanks. So Alabama Arise is one of the organizations that we support as a congregation. And they are uh, one of the supporters of a, a set of workshops that are happening on June 3rd in Montgomery. And it's an all-day uh, event. It's called Democracy Now or Never. And you can imagine what it's about. It's uh, uh, something that uh, we all need to be a part of in one way or another. So I'm going to post this on the bulletin board in the back if you'd like to see more information. Uh, it doesn't really say exactly where this is happening except downtown during the day, and then there are, there's more going on at the Riverfront Amphitheater later in the evening. So I assume there will be more information coming, but June 3rd is right around the corner, so I'm not sure when. Please join us now for our Southern Benediction. guide you on your journey forward, joy meet you at every turn, and hope be your daily practice. May gratitude companion you, compassion embolden you, and open-hearted courage be your unending choice. May peace challenge you, dear ones, generosity empower you, and may you know it every day, that you are enough, just exactly as you are and you are not alone. <coughs> Amen, blessed be, and farewell. Thank <laughs> you.